بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسربنا على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الانبياء وعلى اله الاسكياء واصحابه الاتقياء اما بعد today in shall we will start with hadith number 13 عن ابي حمزه انس بن مالك رضي الله عنه خادم النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لا يؤمن احدكم حتى يحب لاخيه ما يحب لنفسه رواه البخاري ومسلم This hadith is narrated by Abu Hamza Anas bin Malik radiyallahu anhu who was the khadim the servant of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He narrates from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said one of you cannot be a complete believer until Till he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. The hadith is narrated by Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi and also by Imam Muslim rahmatullahi alayhi. Previously we discussed that how Imam Nabawi rahmatullahi alayhi has structured this book. He starts off by talking about the fundamentals, um, talks about the importance of intention, the pillars of Islam, hadith of Jibreel. Then he brings some very important uh, primary discussions about innovation in Islam, understanding the concept of halal and haram and so on. And now Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi is bringing those ahadith that relate to perfection in character. Because after establishing a foundation, there is a need for us to focus on developing our character. How we deliver that deen to other people will be ultimately through our character, how we interact with others. So this hadith he brings is by Abu Hamza Anas bin Malik radiyallahu <clears> anhu. <throat> he is a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam known as al-imam, al-mufti, al-muqri, al-muhaddith. The imam, the mufti, the jurist of his time, the scholar of hadith of his time, the one known for being the khadim, the servant of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some while introducing him have mentioned that Akhiru sahabihi mawtan, that he was the last companion to pass away. This isn't factual. He is the last companion of the Prophet ﷺ to pass away from one angle, but from another angle he isn't. And I'll talk more about this later on while I'm uh, talking about explaining who Anas bin Malik is. He was someone very close to the Prophet ﷺ. He says in one narration that the Prophet ﷺ one day called upon me and he said to me, Ya dal udhnain, O the one with two ears. The reason why the Prophet ﷺ called him by this title, O the one with two ears, was to highlight how he was someone that was always all ears for the Prophet ﷺ. Anytime the Prophet ﷺ needed anything, he was there present without asking any question, being there to fulfill that need of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was a, he was born ten years before migration, which means by the time the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam passes away, he is roughly twenty years old. According to one narration, Anas bin Malik radiallahu an says that when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam arrived to Medina Munawwara, he was eight years old. In another narration, it is stated that he was nine years old, but the more common narration is he was ten years old. So he was somewhere between. Eight, nine, ten years old when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam arrives in Medina Munawwara. His mother is a known companion. His father left his mother because he decided not to be a Muslim. His mother accepted Islam um, and then remarried to Abu Talha al Ansari radiallahu an because of his deen and how he was a religious person. Abu Talha actually decided to accept Islam because of his interest in marrying Anas bin Malik radiallahu an's mother. Anas bin Malik radiallahu an's mother plays a key role in making Anas bin Malik into who he is. That very important person to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A part of that inner circle of the Prophet's life, Anas bin Malik's mother plays that pivotal role for making this happen, to bringing this into existence. So who was she? She was commonly known as Umm Sulaim. This was a name she commonly went by. Scholars differ in her actual birth name. Imam Abu Nu'aym al-Asbahani writes in his Ma'rifat al-Sahaba, Ummuhu Umm Sulaym bint Milhan wa ismuha Mulaika. He says that her name was Mulaika. While other scholars, they say her name was Rumaysa. 
and others say her name was Ghumaysa. Regardless, she is a famous companion who narrates hadith as well from the Prophet ﷺ. And um, she is known by her kunya, um, Umm Sulaim. Umm Sulaim and her husband, Abu Talha al-Ansari, are very close to the Prophet ﷺ. And Anas bin Malik is also very close to the Prophet ﷺ. So it's not just one person, it's not just a single man's effort. It's a whole family effort. All of them see and realize the importance of companionship with the Prophet ﷺ. If one person in the family feels the need to spiritually grow, that generally isn't enough. I mean, it's good, it can get you far. But if the whole family is on the same page, then it brings a whole new flavor. Anas bin Malik anh's mother, Umm Sulaim, is so close to the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Talha al-Ansari was known for his generosity and his closeness to the Prophet ﷺ. And, I, and I'll make reference to each of them multiple times today. And I'm going to share narrations and incidents regarding them and their generosity and how they were key figures. And then you have Anas bin Malik And because these people were so close, the Prophet ﷺ, these three people in particular were so close, the Prophet ﷺ gave extra attention to this family. There's a famous narration that one day Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu he came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I have a young brother who's been very sad lately, a little depressed. The Prophet ﷺ said, What happened? He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, his bird passed away. Young kid who was connected to his bird, you can imagine how emotional he must have been. So the Prophet ﷺ said, It's okay, we'll go visit him. Now this, is, this in itself shows the humbleness of the Prophet ﷺ. He has a million things going on from revelation, which is like, you know, his ultimate responsibility, ultimate honor, to all the way of managing Medina Munawwara, dealing with the hypocrites, dealing with the Jewish community in Medina Munawwara who were causing a lot of problems in the markets and betrayal and dealing with the threats from Makkah. I mean, all sorts of issues. But the Prophet ﷺ goes to this young kid, he sits next to him, and he says to him, Ya Aba Umayr, ma fa'ala al-Mughayr. And the statement of the Prophet ﷺ is so interesting, so beautiful. I can talk about it in detail, but we'll leave that for another time. The impact of the statement, the rhyming method of the Prophet ﷺ, calling him Abu Umayr, this young kid, treating him as an adult, it brings a smile to the kid's face and he, it helps him get over this, um, this calamity in life, this death that he's experiencing. Now the Prophet ﷺ gives this young child that special moment. And imagine how much this child cherished that. Having that moment in his life that the Prophet ﷺ was giving him personal time, sitting next to him, cheering him up. The interesting thing is that this child actually didn't live long. He passed away at a young age. And there's a narration regarding his passing away. That Abu Talha al-Ansari and Umm Sulaim, they had a child who was very sick. And Abu Talha and his mother, his wife had given so much of their time taking care of the child that one day Abu Talha said to his wife that I'll quickly run to the market and take care of some chores that I have. Keep an eye on the child. So when he went to the market, meanwhile, the child's health became so bad that the child passed away. And his mother quickly washed the body. She shrouded the body and kept it in the corner of the home. When Abu Talha al-Ansari returned home, he asked his wife, how is our child doing? And the mother responded back by saying that he's in much more comfort right now than he previously was. The reason why she doesn't tell him is because she notices that he's hungry. And if she tells him that her child passed away, their child passed away, he wouldn't eat. The trauma would kill him. So she feeds him and after feeding him, she notices that he's hungry, he's tired too. And there's no janazah, no funeral prayer that will happen at the middle of the night. So she says, I'll just delay until telling him till the morning. Let him rest, let him eat. That night, he goes to sleep and he has an intimate relationship with her. The next morning when they wake up, she tells him that our child passed away. He's devastated. He goes to the Prophet ﷺ, he runs there. He tells the Prophet ﷺ that his wife didn't tell him, she kept it quiet from him. And the Prophet ﷺ says, maybe through her wisdom, Allah will bless you with many more children. And that child who passed away was this very same, Ya Aba Umayr ma fa'ala nughayr, the child whose bird passed away. So such a short life, but the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made it so meaningful. Abu Tal uh, Anas bin Malik radiallahu an, he was very particular on imitating the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
You know, on occasion he would also wear a black turban, as was also the habit of the Prophet ﷺ to wear on occasion. Salman bin Wardan says, "Ra'itu ala Anas in imamat in Sauda, qad arkhaha bayna min khalfihi." That he was wearing a black turban, and the the sides of the turban, the part that hangs, he was hanging it behind him. Abu Talut Abdul Salam says, "Ra'itu ala Anas in imama." That I saw Anas bin Malik radiAllahu anhu also wearing the turban. This was his practice. Anas bin Malik radiAllahu anhu also used to wear a ring, imitating the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the. Inscription on that ring was "Kana Nakshu Khat Anasin Asadun Rabidun." What was written, the engraving on his ring, were the two words "Asadun Rabidun." Asadun means lion. Rabidun can either mean lion, lion, or it can mean resting or lying down, meaning a resting lion. Don't bother this guy right here. You waken him up, he's going to come jump on you. He had many teachers. And his primary and direct teacher was none other than the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And along with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he narrates from Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, from Umar radiallahu an, from Uthman radiallahu an, Muadh bin Jabal, Usaid bin Hudayr, Abu Talha, his own mother Umm Sulaim bint Milhan, his khala, his mother's sister Umm Haram. He narrates from his wife. Um, he also narrates from Umm Haram's husband, Ubadah bin Samit radiallahu anh. He narrates from Abu Dhar. He narrates from Malik bin Sa'asa'a. He narrates from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anh. So many people. And some of the people that he narrates from, they don't narrate directly from the Prophet, but they narrate from other companions, who then narrate from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn Al-Awn says, as he narrates from uh, Muhammad ibn Sirin, that Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh didn't like narrating too much from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even though he narrates much more than other companions, but in comparison to how much he could have narrated, he would narrate little. فَكَانَ إِذَا حَدَّثَ When he would narrate from the Prophet ﷺ, very few times we would hear him narrating, but after the narration he would say the following statement. Every time he would narrate from the Prophet ﷺ, Anas bin Malik would say the following statement. And the following statement would be, أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهُ صلى الله عليه وسلم. This statement means, Whatever awkama qala Rasulullah means, whatever I just said the Prophet said, the Prophet said something very similar to that. Maybe I made a mistake, so overlook that because the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it uh, kept the companions worried. Which, which statement? Whoever lies upon me intentionally, let him find his abode in the fire of hell. Let him find his seat in the fire of hell. So because of that, he would, after each uh, hadith, he would say awkama qala Rasulullah. That something similar to this is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. There is an interesting incident in Takmir and Tahdeeb al Kamal fi Asma al Rijal. That once Anas bin Malik, Humayd narrates, Hamad bin Salama narrates from Humayd, that Anas bin Malik radiallahu an one day was narrating from the Prophet. This very same narration can also be found, and Ibn Sa'd, uh, he narrates this, hadith, this narration. Also, Ibn Asakir narrates this narration as well. That one day Anas bin Malik radiallahu an was narrating from the Prophet to his students. So one person was there, فَقَالَ رَجُلٌ That person said, أَنْتَ سَمِعْتَهُ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ Did you really hear this hadith directly from the Prophet صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ فَغَذِبَ غَذْبًا شَدِيدًا Anas bin Malik رضي الله عنه became upset at his question. وقال, and he said, وَاللَّهِ مَا كُلُّ مَا نُحَدِّثُكُمْ سَمِعْنَاهُ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ He said, I swear by Allah, not every hadith we narrate to you, we heard directly from the Prophet ﷺ. However, we narrate from one another, meaning the companions. He heard something from the Prophet of Allah. I narrate it saying that the Prophet ﷺ said it. It doesn't necessarily mean I heard it directly. And you have to remember this principle. Many narrations where the companions are narrating from the Prophet ﷺ, it doesn't always mean they heard it directly. It's very possible they heard that narration through another sahabi who heard it from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam however if the companion says sami'tu min rasulillah that i heard from the prophet of allah then what does that mean directly it's ittisal marfu' directly from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam otherwise now someone can say that if a narrator is missing in a cha- in a chain does that make the narration weak if a narrator is missing in a chain let's say for example anas bin malik is saying the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said 
When the truth is, he didn't hear it directly from the Prophet of Allah. He heard it through someone else who heard it from the Prophet of Allah. So, because there is a narrator potentially missing in the narration, does that make the narration weak? Generally, it would. However, if the person missing is a Sahabi of the Prophet wasallam, and the person skipping him is another Sahabi, then it doesn't make it weak at all. Because we have no doubt that the Sahabi narrating, the companion narrating, is making no mistake in narrating what he heard from another companion. And because the person missing is a companion, there is no doubt of any sort of weakness. There's no doubt of any lie. Any accusa- no accusation could be made. Because all companions are authentic narrators. They are all just an upright narrator. So if a person misses the name of a companion, and the narrator himself is a companion, it brings no weakness to the narration. I find this, interesting, this hadith interesting because it creates perspective. We all know that Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anh, narrates so much from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa But when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa passed away, he was no more than maybe 11, 12 years old. What most people fail to realize is that majority of Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anh's narrations from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa are actually not direct. A good 95% of them are indirect narrations. 95%. He narrates very few ahadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa directly. Similarly, Hassan bin Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhumah. Hassan radiallahu anh. How many narrations does he have directly from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa According to some scholars, under 10 narrations. But the other narrations that he's narrating, he's narrating them through other companions. And this was a common thing, one companion would narrate from another companion. Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh had many students. Amongst them were the likes of Hassan al-Basri. Hassan al-Basri. Because Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh, towards the end of his life, spends a good portion of years in Basra. So since he's now in this Kufa, Basra, Iraq area, the, the, the Iraqis are exposed to his tradition. Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh, near his students from amongst them are Hassan al-Basri, Ibn Sidin, Shabi, Abu Qilaba, Makhul, Umar bin Abdul Aziz, Thabit al-Banani, um, Bakr bin Abdullah al-Muzani, al-Zuhri, Qatada, Ibn al-Munkadir, and there are so many more whose names you can continue. Until the point that Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi directly saw Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh and also narrates through him too. That's why amongst the Ayma Arba, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, and Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, the only of these four that actually saw a Sahabi during his life was none other than Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi. He is the only one who actually saw him. Shaykh Abdul Hafid Makki rahimahullah, who recently passed away a few months back, just recently passed away. He's buried in Mecca Mukarramah. He actually published a book called The Musnad of Imam Abu Hanifa, the ahadith that Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi narrates. And in particular, he gave me a copy of that book as a gift. And I recall when I was reading through it, it was such a beautiful book because the narrations, in particular, he had one part of the book dedicated to Narrations that Imam Abu Hanifa narrates directly from companions. The narration that he brings directly from certain companions. Now, one point of principle. There are many people who, who attribute being a student to Anas bin Malik. Many people attribute that because he traveled a lot, in particular him being in Basra as well. So Imam Dhahabi rahmatullahi alayhi gives a very beautiful principle. He says that most of Imam Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu's authentic narrators, meaning his very strong, sturdy, authentic students, ashabuhu al-thiqat ila ba'dil khamsina wa mi'a. They did not last beyond 150 years after hijrah. So that was their cutoff point. He says basically anyone who claims to be an authentic student of Anas bin Malik after 150 years of hijrah, that person has weakness in his, in his narrating. And then the second category are those people who narrate from him, but they're considered to be more weak students. They're not his direct, immediate, strong, first class students. And who are those? These are those who lived up to 190 years after Hijrah. And then they say anyone who narrates from Anas bin Malik after the second 200 years after Hijrah, that person, there is no authenticity to that person. Then Imam Dhahabi rahmatullahi alayhi, he, he writes, that um, there are over 200 sahaba, uh, students of Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh, who narrate from him, uh, um, from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh, what makes him very special 
is that he served the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for ten years. In one narration, he says that when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam arrived in Medina Munawwara, my mother held me by the hand, أخذت أمي بيدي فانطلقت بي إليه. My mother held me by the hand and took me to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and she says. Ya Rasulullah, lam yabqa rajulun wa la imra'atun min al-ansar illa wa qad athafaka bi tuhfatin. She says, O Messenger of Allah, since you have arrived in Medina Munawwara, there isn't a lady or man left in the city that has, but they've come to you with a gift. And she says, wa inni la aqdir, and I don't have anything to give you. I'm not a wealthy lady, I don't have much in my possession. Illa ibni hadha, except for this son of mine. This son of mine I wish to give you. Fakhuz wal yakhdumka ala ma badalak. Keep him with you and let him serve you for whatever you, f- you seem fit. قَالَ فَخَدِمْتُ عَشْرَ سِنِينَ Anas bin Malik رضي الله عنه says, So I served the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for ten years. فَمَا ضَرَبَنِي وَلَا سَبَّنِي He did not hit me, neither did he ever use foul language towards me. وَلَا عَبَسَ فِي وَجْهِ And neither did he ever make uh, uh, a disapproval, never ever express disapproval in front of me. Or agitation in front of me. The Prophet ﷺ was never agitated in front of me. He was very calm and he was very, very patient with me. So again, coming back to this point, if you want your kids to become something, if you want something out of them, you have to learn to guide them from a young age. In particular, teach them to be in the companionship of the great scholars of your area or your region. There's great scholars of their time. Go and sit them with them. And it's this companionship That'll make them into something. And I, I always say this, that Anas bin Malik became who he was because his mother held his hand. And his mother took him there. And then she says, O Messenger of Allah, I want my son to be with you. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam generously accepted. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a very special dua for Anas bin Malik. And there are various uh, narrations sharing that dua. In one narration, Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh says that my mother had covered me in her khimar, in her shawl. And she presented me to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and she said, O Messenger of Allah, هذا Unais ibni. Unais means small Anas. Unais. Any Arabic word on the scale of fu'ailun, like Husaynun, that means something in small quantity. So Husaynun means small beauty. Unais is? Small Anas, because he was a young kid at the time, little munchkin. That's her way of saying, this is my little guy right here. She says, هذا أنيس ibni. This is my little Unais. I brought him so he can serve you. فَدْعُ اللَّهَ لَهُ So I want you to make dua for him. Now the second thing, Anas bin Malik's mother doesn't stop by just presenting her child for khidmah. What's the second thing she also does? She's requesting dua for her son as well. This is also from the tradition. That when you see scholars, when you see mashayikh, when you see the friends of Allah, the elders of the community, you know, those who have served the deen, you present your kids to them and you say, make dua for my child. You don't know whose dua will work on your child and inshallah your child will do khidmah of the deen. And with that very same greed or uh, uh, desire, she says, O Messenger of Allah, make dua for him. So the Prophet wasallam made dua, Allahumma akthir, O Allah, increase. Malahu wa waladahu, increase him in wealth and increase him in children. So Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh says, Fawallahi inna mali la kathir. I swear by Allah that Allah gave me a lot of wealth. And then he says, Wa inna waladi wa walada waladi uh, yata'aduna ala nahwin min mi'ati al yawm. He says, If you count my children and my grandchildren today, as Anas bin Malik is narrating this hadith, he says, Today I have over a hundred kids and grandkids. Today I have over a hundred kids and one hundred guys. That's a lot of kids. MashaAllah. It's as if that dua of the Prophet wasallam, the thought of a hundred kids running around is terrifying. But they were sahaba and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the guidance. And another thing is that many times having so many kids for people like us may not be desirable as well because tarbiyah is hard in our day. You should have kids that you can take care of. If a person has a hundred kids and he isn't, and he's neglecting all hundred kids, then these kids are going to testify against you on the day of judgment. These were Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and communities were different then too, where it was a community effort of upbringing a kid. It wasn't, you know, you and your home and your five bedroom house. It was that's not all it was. It was much more of a society that worked together. 
ولد لانس بن مالك 80 ولدا انس بن مالك رضي الله عنه had 780 kids 78 ذكرا out of which 78 were male وابنتان and two daughters احداهما حفصة one of his two daughters her name was حفصة and والاخرى تكنى ام عمر ام عمر and her second his second daughter was commonly known as ام عمر um, ابو يقظان says that over 80 of Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu's kids died in the plague of Jarif. The plague of Al Jarif. Over 80 of his kids died in that plague. It was a great plague and many, many people died. As for his wealth, he had so much wealth that he had a garden and in one year his garden would bring fruits twice. يَحْمِلُ فِي السَّنَةِ الْفَاكِهَةَ مَرَّتَيْنِ وَكَانَ فِيهَا رَيْحَانٌ يَجِئُ مِنْهُ رِيحُ الْمِسْكِ And from his garden there was this fragrance that would come that would bring this beautiful fragrance of musk. In another narration, Anas bin Malik an shares that very same dua. And he says the Prophet ﷺ made not only two duas, O oh Allah, increase them in wealth and children. He made a third dua. And the third dua was, Allahumma akthir malahu wa waladahu wa adkhilhu al-jannah. O oh Allah, increase his wealth and increase his children and grant him Jannah. Then Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh says something very beautiful. And you can find this narration in Tahdeeb al-Kamal fi Asma al-Rijal. Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh says, قَالَ فَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ إِثْنَيْنِ وَأَنَا أَرْجُ الثَّالِثَ He said, I've seen two of these during my life. And I hope that Allah will accept the third for me too. I saw that Allah gave me barakah on my wealth and my children. As for Jannah, I have hope in Allah that Allah will accept that part of the dua as well. In one narration, the Prophet ﷺ came to visit Umm Sulaim. He came to visit her. And she presented some dates to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ was fasting. So he came to the corner of the home and the Prophet ﷺ prayed two rak'ah there. Anas bin Malik says, وَصَلَّيْنَ مَعَهُ ثُمَّ دَعَى لِأُمِّ Sulaim." After we finished praying, the Prophet ﷺ, we prayed with him. And after praying, the Prophet ﷺ made special dua for Umm Sulaim. And he made dua for her family. But Umm Sulaim wasn't happy. So she said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, makes, I have one special request for you. The Prophet ﷺ said, Mahiya, what is it? So she said, Khadimuka Anas, I want you to make dua for your servant Anas bin Malik. So the Prophet ﷺ then raised his hands. And Anas bin Malik says, فَمَا تَرَكَ خَيْرَ آخِرَةٍ وَلَا دُنْيَا He didn't leave anything that was from the good of this world or the good of the hereafter, but the Prophet made that dua for me. إِلَّا دَعَا لِي بِهِ وَقَالْ اللَّهُمْ بَرْزُقْهُ مَالًا وَوَلَدًا وَبَارِكْ لَهُ فِيهِ O oh Allah, give him sustenance in his wealth and increase him in children and give barakah in there too. You know, Anas bin Malik became very wealthy. And there's a narration that Abu Nu'aym al-Asbahani narrates in his Ma'rifat al-Sahaba. That one person, he says that, I saw Anas bin Malik performing hajj. And when I looked at his teeth, he had to tie one of his teeth because his teeth was maybe loose. So they strengthened his teeth using gold. Meaning he was, mashallah, living the, living the good life uh, through that dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was close to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and by the side of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, Anas radiallahu anhu himself says that I participated with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Hudaybiyah, in the Umrah, in his Hajj, in the conquest of Mecca, in Hunayn, in Ta'if, in Khaybar. I was with the Prophet of Allah in all of these expeditions. Someone one day asked him that did you even participate in the battle of Badr? Because if you look at Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu's name, you won't find it in the list of the Sahaba who participated in the battle of Badr. His name's not there. So someone asked him, Ashahid the Badran, did you participate in the Battle of Badr? So uh, Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh became frustrated and he said, La umma lak, may you have no mother. Wa aina aghibu an Badr, and how do you expect me to remain absent from the Battle of Badr? Thumma qal, he then said, Thumma qal, uh, he then said, that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam exited for the Battle of Badr, I took special permission from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to participate. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave me permission to stay in the back of the of, of our camp, meaning helping the sick and cooking food and helping with smaller chores. But unfortunately, he wasn't able to participate in the battle itself. And that's why his name isn't listed amongst the Sahaba who participated in the Battle of Badr. Because he served a more supportive role 
than an actual active role in the battle itself. Thabut al-Bunani uh, says that Abu Hurair radiallahu anh said that I have never seen anyone pray salah that imitated the salah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than the son of Umm Sulaim, meaning Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh. And another sahabi, he says that Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh would stand so long in his prayers that his feet would swell up. Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh, because he was a khadim of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he also brings certain unique narrations. Unique meaning not everyone can narrate these ahadith, but he was able to because he was in that inner circle of the Prophet sallallahu One of those narrations is the hadith where he narrates that the Prophet sallallahu visited all nine of his wives and he only bathed once. Meaning, what, is this, what did we learn from this? That a person can be intimate multiple times without repeating the ghusl. If a person is intimate with their spouse and they wish to be intimate again, they don't have to do, perform a bath before being, becoming intimate again. It is permissible for them to become intimate multiple times and then at the end of it just perform one ghusl that will suffice them from the state of impurity. And Asbim Malik was a very pious person. He, was, he would fast regularly. One day he was unable to fast so he ordered a pot of tharid. <clears throat> tharid was a type of food they had. It was a high quality, very nice, meaty, uh, fatty food. Something that the Arabs would enjoy. And when he sat down to eat, وَدَعَا ثَلَاثِينَ مِسْكِينًا فَأَطْعَمَهُمْ He didn't eat alone, he invited 30 people to his home. And he fed all 30 people of them. He was very kind to his family. He enjoyed being with his family, enjoyed playing with them and having a good time. Thumam ibn Abdullah says that Anas bin Malik رضي الله عنه, he would, sit in the, he would sit outside his home and there would be a firash, there would be like a little uh, a takht, a little um, area where he would sit, a little raised, elevated platform he would sit on there. And وَيَرْمِي وَلَدُهُ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ His children would gather in front of him and they would practice their arrow. So he says, فَخَرَجَ عَلَيْنَا يَوْمًا وَنَحْنُ نَرْمِي One day we came outside and we were engaging in archery, practicing our, our aim. فَقَالَ يَا بُنَيَّ He said, Oh my children, bit سَمَا تَرْمُونَ you guys have horrible aim. ثُمَّ أَخْضَ الْقَوْسَ فَرَمَا بِهَا فَمَا أَخْطَأَ الْقِرْطَاسِ He then took it. You know how uh, the elders always say, you guys have bad aim, give it to the old guy. And then you see that uncle sit on the carom board and just schooling everyone. So Anas bin Malik radiallahu an takes the arrow and he starts firing the arrows and every shot he took right on target. Bullseye, 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 bullseye. The companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa now towards the end of Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh's life, he had a huge conflict. It wasn't really his fault. It was the other guy's fault. And this particular person had a bad record of picking fights with companions. He picked a fight with Abdullah bin Zubair, picked a fight with Abdullah bin Umar. And here he's also picking a fight with Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh. His name is Hajjaj bin Yusuf al thaqafi right? Picked so many fights and he also picked a fight with Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh. He one day came to um, Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh and he said to him, Ya Khabith, O impure man, the one who spreads fitna, sometimes you stand by Ali, sometimes you stand by Ibn Zubair, sometimes you stand by Ibn al Ash'ath. He said, I swear by the one in whose hand my soul lies, I will pull you out by the root and I will throw you away like a locust. Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh then came to him and said, Who are you talking about? Who's this Khabith and who's this guy that you want to uproot and throw away? So Hajjaj bin Yusuf said, Iyaka Ani, I'm talking about you. You're the man who's this Khabith person. Asamallahu Samaat, may Allah make you deaf and Allah take away your hearing. So Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh, Fasarja'a Anas bin Malik, when he, Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh heard this, he said, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And then he left that gathering and he came home and some of his Students and some of his close friends were there. And he said, Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh said, Had I not feared this evil man on my own kids, I would have responded to him today. I would have said certain things to him today that he would never dare in front of me ever again. No one would ever dare challenge me ever again. But because I fear this man's evil on my kids, I let him go. So Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh then wrote a letter to the Khalifa, Abdul Malik bin Marwan. And he complained to him of Hajjaj's language and his insults and how he was becoming very aggressive. And in the letter he wrote something very powerful. He wrote in there 
إني خدمت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم تسعة سنين. عبد الملك I served the Prophet of Allah for nine years. والله لو أن النصارى أدركوا رجلا خدم نبيهم لأكرموه. He said I swear by Allah if the Christian people had a person from amongst them who served their Prophet the way I served mine for nine years there wouldn't dare be one person raise a voice against him. And here you have a person who's speaking disrespectfully to a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. According to some narrations, Abdul Malik bin Marwar ordered Hajjaj to apologize. Because for the greater part, Anas bin Malik wasn't one of the forerunners in politics, so he had him apologize. He was someone who loved the Prophet ﷺ very dearly. When the Prophet ﷺ passed away, as a hadith can be found in Tirmidhi, Anas bin Malik says, the day the Prophet arrived in Medina, it was the most bright day in our city. And the day the Prophet ﷺ passed away, that was the darkest day in Medina Munawwara. Muthanna bin Sa'id says <clears throat> that I heard Anas bin Malik saying, مَا مِن لَيْلَةٍ إِلَّا وَأَنَا أَرَى فِيهَا حَبِيبِي ثُمَّ يَبْكِي Anas bin Malik says, there isn't one night but in it I see my beloved, my beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu start crying. Every night in his dream, ma min laylatin illa wa ana ara fiha habibi. Every night he used to see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his dream. And after sharing this, he would then sit with his companions and he would cry. And the companions loved him for that too. There's another narration that... Um, A companion came to visit Anas bin Malik. And when he came to visit him, one of his servants whose name was Jamila, she came and told him that the so-and-so companion is here to meet you. So he says to her, Ya Jamila, na wilini tiban amassahu bihi yadi. He said, go and bring me some fragrance so I can put it on my hand. He said, because so-and-so companion who has come to meet me, every time he, come, every time he comes, la yarda hatta yuqabbilu yadi. He kisses my hand every time. Yaqulu, he says, Yadun masat yada Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a hand that touched the hand of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I wish to kiss this hand in honor of your uh, closeness to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this companionship that, you, that he had. Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu passed away. Um, actually, before I even share what year he passed away, and I want to make clear that there is a big difference of opinion on what year exactly he passed away in. Humayd says that he passed away in the year 91 after Hijrah. This is also the opinion of Qatada, also the opinion of Sa'id bin Ufayr and Abu Ubaid. Al-Waqidi says that he passed away not in 91, rather in 92 years after Hijrah. And the third opinion is that he passed away in 93 after Hijrah. This is the opinion of Ibn Uliya, Sa'id bin Amr. Al-Mada'ini, Abu Nu'im, Khalifa, Fallas, and others as well. He lived over 103 years of age. Lived many years. You know, it's interesting because I was reading about his age and I wanted to see um, what the different opinions were. And I came across this interesting risala written by um, Imam Jalaluddin Suyuti rahmatullahi alayhi. I started reading it and I found it very interesting. Unfortunately, we won't be able to cover that risala in this class because it's, it's a very niche issue that he touches on. But in that risala, he covers the biographies of all of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ who lived to 120 years of age. He lists all of them. And he covers their biographies. A very Suyuti thing to do. Imam Suyuti chooses these very small niche issues and writes these interesting uh, works on them. Now the claim that he was the last Sahabi to live how true and how far is that? The last, last, last Sahabi to actually live was a Sahabi by the name of Abu Tufail Amr bin Wathira al Laythi. He is considered the last Sahabi to live. He saw the Prophet ﷺ during Hajjatul Wada'. That's when he saw the Prophet. ﷺ. And he passed away in Makkah, the Sahabi, he passed away in Makkah in the year 110 Hijri. As stated by Imam Dhahabi rahmatullahi alayhi. He is considered to be the last Sahabi. Now the reason why Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh is referred to being the last Sahabi is because 
He wasn't the last Sahabi overall to pass away. He was the last Sahabi to pass away in Basra. He was the last Sahabi to pass away in Basra. Ali ibn al-Madini, he actually says this, the last person to pass away from the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was um, Anas bin Malik. And Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu himself said one day, فَأَنَا آخِرُ مَنْ بَقِيَ I am the last one that remains of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The last Sahabi to pass away in Medina Munawwara, according to some, was Sahal bin Sa'ad al-Sa'idi. Sahal bin Sa'ad al-Sa'idi. And others they say, it was Jabir bin Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The last Sahabi to pass away in Sham, according to some, it was Abu Umama al-Bahili radiyallahu an, and according to others, it was Abdullah bin Busr radiyallahu an al-Mazini. The last Sahabi to pass away in Kufa was Abdullah bin Abi Awfa, Abdullah bin Abi Awfa radiyallahu an, and the last Sahabi to pass away in Egypt was Abdullah bin Harith radiyallahu taala an. When Anas bin Malik radiyallahu an passed away, Qatada said. Uh, Muwarriq said, ذَهَبَ الْيَوْمْ نِصْفُ الْعِلْمِ That today, half of نِصْفُ الْعِلْمِ has gone. Half of knowledge has left us because he was a person who was so close to the Prophet ﷺ. Now there are many narrations from Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh. There are a few narrations of his that I want to share with you very briefly. Very beautiful narrations and I thought I would share them because he narrates them from the Prophet ﷺ. <clears throat> Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu says, a person said, O Messenger of Allah, how will a disbeliever be resurrected on his face on the Day of Judgment? How will he be resurrected? كَيْفَ يُحْشَرُ الْكَافِرُ عَلَىٰ وَجْهِهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِنَّ الَّذِي أَمْشَاهُ عَلَىٰ رِجِلَيْهِ قَادِمٌ أَنْ يُمْشِيَهُ عَلَىٰ وَجْهِهِ That the one who gave him the ability to walk on his feet in the world also has the ability to drag him on his face in the hereafter too. Another narration from Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu he says that sometimes a person through good character reaches high ranks of the hereafter, even though when it comes to ibadah, he's weak. Sometimes you might be weak in your worship, but your good character can take you to high ranks in Jannah. And sometimes a person can be a great worshiper, but because of his bad character, he lies in the, in the holes of the fire of hell. And then Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu narrates from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, whoever seeks knowledge so that he may um, he may debate with scholars and fool the foolish people, or to turn faces towards him, let him find his seat in the fire of hell, meaning a person who's insincere to knowledge. And the last hadith I want to share with you before we get into the class itself, the hadith itself here, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, as Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu narrates, if alul khaira dahrakum. Spend your entire life doing good. Your entire life. And keep presenting yourself to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy can reach every, any person. And ask Allah to cover your faults. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to protect you in your fears. Now this hadith right here, let's come to the hadith itself. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, one of you cannot be a believer until he loves for his brother when he loves for himself. What does this hadith mean? Someone can object. If I don't love for my brother or what I love for myself, does that mean I'm not a believer anymore? Because that's what the hadith is saying. Do sins or inappropriate actions take a person outside of iman? If a person commits a sin, does it take him out of iman? If a person drinks alcohol, does that make them a kafir? You guys understand my question? If someone commits zina, does that make them a kafir? If someone deals in riba, does that make them a kafir? Does that take them outside of Islam? This was the opinion of the khawarij. There was a group of people who came in Islamic history. They're known as being the first people, um, the first deviant group in Islamic history, the Khawarij. And their opinion was the one who commits a major sin leaves the folds of Islam. That's not the opinion of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. When we read a hadith like this, we, we translate them as one of you cannot be a complete believer, meaning there is not completion in his faith or her faith until they love for their brother or sister what they love for themselves. Now in this hadith, the, the theme that's being taught to us is the importance of giving preference to others over yourself. Preferring others over yourself, giving others opportunity. In Arabi, this is called ithar. What is it called? Ithar with a tha. Ithar. And we find this in the Quran again and again. لَن تَنَارُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا 
مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You cannot reach complete piety until you spend that with that which you love. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا يُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا إِنَّمَا نُتِعْمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءً وَلَا شُكُورًا Many examples of the Qur'an telling us and encouraging us to give preference to others over ourselves. Imam Qurtubi rahmatullahi alayhi, while defining ithar, he says, ithar is to put others forward ahead of yourself. When it comes to matters of this world, and also when it comes to matters of the deen. And he said, this is only possible if a person has strength in their iman, and that person has deep love, and if that person has the ability to be patient on difficulty. If you can't be patient, you'll never want anyone ahead of you. Why is that? Because putting someone else ahead of you means that you will face some shade of inconvenience. Because you're not getting the convenience that person has. So you have to learn to have patience. How can you give preference to another person if you love them? If you love another person, then you can give them preference. And you have to have iman because trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala says there are three grades, three levels of ithar, of giving preference to others. He says one is that you give preference to others over yourself. Simple. You have a sandwich, you're hungry, there's someone next to you on the street that also looks hungry. Before you eat your sandwich, what do you do? You offer it to that person. Why don't you take my sandwich? You have money, you're about to go buy yourself something from the store. You see a person standing outside and they're begging, you give them the money. Here, you take this. You're going to go buy yourself a nice five-bedroom home even though you don't need five bedrooms and a nice upscale neighborhood even though you don't need that upscale neighborhood, right? And instead of spending half million, one million dollars on that house, you think to yourself, you know, I know some people who live very poor lives, let me go give them the money. I'll live my life the way it is, let me go give someone else. The ability to pay off others' debts, the ability to care for other people is gone. People don't have it in them anymore. Giving preference to others over yourself. We want us to be the center of the world. Everyone is worried about me, me, me. Nobody cares about anyone anymore. That's a state that we're in. You know, and remember this, because the hadith teaches us, when you learn to put others in front of you, Allah will take care of you. But when you put yourself at the front of the line, Allah leaves your affairs to you. You deal with yourself then. But if you let others go in front of you, if you take care of other people, Allahu fi yawn al abd, ma kan al abd fi yawn akhi. As long as you are there to support others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will support you. You remove difficulty from others, Allah will remove difficulty from you in the hereafter. I was teaching the hadith earlier today, and the chapter was regarding assisting one another to pay off debts. Assisting one another to pay off debts. That if a person is struggling, you go and help them pay off their debt. Now you know one of the problems that I want to play the devil's advocate and flip the issue over. I know I talk about the importance of paying off other people's debts and loaning them money. But one reason why no one wants to loan others money is because the people in the community no longer have decency to return the money on time. Tell me you don't know someone or you yourself aren't a person who loaned someone money 20 years ago to get them to arrive in this country and 20 years have passed and they don't, they're not interested in paying back your loan. How many people do we know like this? That spend their nights crying on their beds because people are refusing to pay back their loan. And they're saying, you're wealthy people, why don't you go ahead and forgive us? Forgiving is not something you can demand. You know, they, there's, a, there's a type of debt, they call it qarad hasana Are you guys aware of that? qarad hasana is a debt where you give someone money with the intention that if they pay me back, alhamdulillah, if they don't pay me back, I forgive them. qarad hasana My shaykh used to say, this is not qarad hasana people call it qarad hasna Hasana means in our language to laugh. You borrow money and you sit there and laugh because you're never going to pay that person back ever again. Karday hasana. Karz leke hasana shudu kardo. That you take the debt and you start laughing at that person because people aren't interested in giving debts. You know during the Prophet ﷺ's time, we always talk about how Sahaba would borrow money to each other. We always talk about that, right? But there's one thing we don't talk about. When the Sahaba would borrow money to one another, there was something that they would always do. Anyone know what it was? Write it down. That's one thing. That's in the Quran. What's another thing they would do? Something nobody talks about. And I say nobody, I mean nobody. That's why I want to talk about it right now. They would do something called run, collateral. If you want to borrow money from me now, I'll give it to you, but keep your wedding jewelry with me. 
You know how everyone's rolling their eyes? That's so much risk. Oh, I'm not taking risk right now by giving you $20,000? That's no risk right now? You want $20,000? I'll give it to you. Leave one of your cars with me. You want $20,000? I'll give it to you. Bring something and leave it with me. See, the people who want to borrow money, what's their mentality? No risk at all. Mazik is in the gives. Take money and go and enjoy it and blow it away. They don't want to take any risk. They're not willing to come and give you collateral. If you come to someone and say, look, I have jewelry that's been passed down on my family generation to the generation. I don't want to sell it, but I need some cash right now. You hold on to my jewelry, I'll give you cash. That person, at the end of the day, he can sleep in peace. Why is that? Because he knows if you run away and if you decide not to pay the money, what does he have something to lie back on? And if you're as sincere as you really are, you're going to pay the money off. So you're going to get your gold back. But why are you, the people, the thing in our, our time of that, how many times did the Prophet ﷺ leave Rahim? So many times. So many narrations. That the Prophet ﷺ borrowed money from a Yahudi and he left his armor as a Rahim. You guys know that? Or a Sahabi would borrow money from someone and he would leave his horse as a Rahim there. Because they would only use their horse when they would travel long journeys and he, didn't need, he wasn't going to travel long journey, so he would give it to them. And even banks today, they won't give you a loan unless they have something to borrow against. You guys know that, right? What do they call it? Collateral. Otherwise, no one's giving you money, just a handout. We have to fix our attitude. We need to learn to take risk on both sides. Come and leave something behind. Give that person something. If you have nothing, then that's another story. But if you have something you can come and give, you come and give that and then walk out. Uh, share, distribute. The second level of ithar, giving preference, is to give preference to the pleasure of Allah over one's own pleasure. بَلْ تُؤْثِرُونَ الْحَيَاةَ dunya. As the Qur'an says, you keep giving preference to yourself over the pleasure of Allah. It's a spiritual ithar. Where now you ask yourself, what does Allah want from me? I want to buy a $500,000 home, but does Allah want that from me? Is that really something I need in my life? You know, you constantly ask yourself, I want to give my wife a divorce, but does Allah want that from me? You keep asking yourself, is that what Allah wants from me? The third degree is that you give preference to others and to Allah, not for yourself, but for the sake of Allah. This is like the bottom of the well. Where you're giving preference, not only to Allah and to others, but you're doing it not for yourself, you're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now how does a person develop ithar? How do you develop this ability to give preference to others over yourself. I'm going to share three things. The first thing is, understand the importance that we have, the importance of the rights that we have towards one another. Understand that. In our mind, we think to ourselves, I don't owe anyone anything. Don't we think that? Every person thinks, I don't owe anyone anything. That's not what the Qur'an is saying. وَآتَ الْمَالَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ in our, in our mind, we think to ourselves, nobody deserves my wealth. But the Qur'an is saying, even though you love your wealth, you give it to the poor. You give it to the traveler. You give it to the orphan. You give it to those that are close to you. Those that are close to you could be your neighbors that are close to you. It could also be those that are close to you, meaning your, your relatives, your family members. But you go out to them and you care for other people. You give them the treatment that you would like for yourself. The second thing is, you have to learn to kill greed. If you can't kill greed, you can't give other people what you love yourself. You cannot love for your brother what you love for yourself until you kill greed. You have to tell yourself, I am happy with the laptop I own today. I don't need another laptop. I'm happy with the phone I have today. Just because tomorrow they come out with an iPhone 8, 9, 10, doesn't mean I, knew, I need an iPhone 8, 9, 10. You want to learn what greed is, watch the next time the, new, the next iPhone or the next Samsung phone comes out. Everyone's greed, they just want the next one. They have no idea why they're buying it. I'm not kidding you. No idea why they're buying it. Most people, what do they use their phones for? Social media, messaging services, uh, YouTube, maybe a game or two. These sort of functions you can fulfill with any standard phone, by the way. You know, there really isn't a need for you to go buy an $800. There, were there was a time where people were reluctant to spend $800 for a laptop. You guys remember that? They wouldn't buy $800 laptop, too expensive. And nowadays people are willing to spend $800 for what? For a phone, and in addition to that phone, what do they say? Oh, I need a tablet too. Another $800. You 
the, 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 this latest Apple tablet, I'm not even sure what the prices are, but from what I checked, it was like 800 and plus, right? And then after they buy the tablet, what do they say? No, no, I need the laptop as well. That's another $1,500. Then what do they say? I think we need the um, desktop as well. And after we get the desktop, I heard there's something called Apple TV these days as well. It's like this more and more and more and more. It's everything. You know, Jazakallah khair for giving me the TV and getting the desktop and getting the laptop and getting the tablet and the phone and the iPad. Allah reward you. But I'm, I don't have the Apple Watch. <laughs> Buy me a watch as well. This is greed. Until you don't get rid of your greed, you won't be able to give preference to others over yourself. Once you have killed it, nipped it in the bud, I'm happy. al I was telling the students in class that the afat of ilm, I'm sorry, the afat of mal, the pain, the disaster, the calamity of wealth is that when, the, the more it increases, shaitan guides you to increasing your expenses. As long as your expenses increase with the increment of your wealth, there's no point increasing your income. You guys understand that? If the ratio of your expenses grow at the same ratio that your income is growing, what is that? It's meaningless. It's, it's, it's useless. What you need to do is cut your income, cut your expenses, and spend more time with your family. But if you're working five hours extra every day to earn other mo- more money, but with more money you have more expenses, it's meaningless. That's why when you go to get a loan, one thing they look at is your debt to income ratio. How much are your expenses and how much are you making? No person should have more expenses, more than one third expenses of your total income. Your total expenses should be no more than, this is like, you know, this is like, these are proper figures, I'm not making these numbers up. These are proper figures, your income should, your expenses should never be more than one third of your income. And if they are, you're living beyond your means. It's too much for you. You have to find ways to cut down. There was a time when we were in college, and I'm being honest with you, where we used to buy this um, instant uh, coffee, Folgers in- instant coffee. You guys remember that? The, the bottle, the glass bottle, it would come like $2 for one bottle. We used to buy one bottle and make it last for a month. So we would drink coffee for one month at the cost of how much? $2. You guys remember those days? Let's not act like I'm the only guy who went to college. Everyone's gone there. You know, we all have those. We probably still have that coffee bottle somewhere in our, in our cabinet at home. $2 coffee would last for how long? One month. And today we've reached a place where, forget instant coffee, it has to be Starbucks. One coffee now has become $4. Where one, where one month was $2, now one coffee has become $4. The greed increases. And with that greed increasing, I can talk about so many examples of how greed inf- you know, infests our lives. But we all are aware of our situation. Allah protect us. And the third thing is the desire to have good character. Every person should have a desire of makarib al akhlaq because you, when you have a desire to be a good person, to show good character, that's when you go out of your way and give preference to other people. You buy yourself a shoe, you'll notice someone else needs shoes, you'll give them your shoes. Here, take my shoes right here. And that's it. You buy yourself a coat, you see someone else's cold, what do you do? Here brother, take my coat. I'll get myself another coat, it's okay. When we do give to other people, we give them the things from our house that are leftovers, that aren't worthy of being used anymore. When the hadith here is teaching us to give to other people, what we need, what we love, and what we desire the most. The Prophet ﷺ was at the forefront of ithar, of giving preference to others over himself. I want to give, I want to share a few examples of ithar from the Prophet's life and the companion's life, and then we'll close off. Just a few stories, so you'll enjoy these stories too. When the Prophet ﷺ would lead a janazah, he would ask the companions, "Does this person have any debt?" If the Sahaba would say yes. There are people who he owes money to. He would then ask, did he leave behind enough wealth to pay off the debt? If they would say yes, the Prophet would leave the janazah. If he didn't leave behind enough wealth to pay off the debts, the Prophet would say to the Sahaba, you guys lead his prayer. He would step to the side. And generally that was a gesture to the companions. And what did that gesture mean? Raise the funds and pay off his debt. So the Sahaba collectively would you know, say, okay, I'll give this much, I'll give this much, and they would pay off that person's debt. Towards the end of the Prophet ﷺ's life, he stopped doing this. The Prophet stopped asking. You know why? 
Because so many conquests occurred and so much wealth came into Medina Munawwara, the Prophet wasallam said to the companions that Allah Azza says, "An Nabiyya Ola bil Mu'minina min Anfusihim," that the, the Prophet is more deserving, or the people are more deserving to honor the Prophet, and the Prophet is more deserving to love the people. So the Prophet says that rather than you people paying off his debt, moving forward, I will pay off everyone's debt. And because the Prophet of Allah was given a khums, a special, uh, uh, an allocated portion from the spoils, he will then use his private funds to pay off the debts of people who had passed away. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, giving preference to others over himself. There's another famous narration that a, um, a companion came, a person came to Medina Munawwara, he said to the Prophet of Allah, that feed me. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I don't have anything. He then sent one companion to go and ask the wives if they had anything at home. And the wives said, ma ma'ana illa al ma, O Messenger of Allah, we don't have anything but water. The only thing we have at home is water. So the Prophet wasallam then publicly announced in the, in the masjid, who will take care of my guest today? Who will feed him and host him tonight? So an Ansari Sahabi said, I'll do it. He took this person home, went to his wife and said, we have the guest of the Prophet wasallam at home with us. This female companion says, his wife says that, Ma'indana illa qutu sibyanina, that we only have enough food for our children. How are we going to feed him? So then he says to his wife, Hayyi hay ta'am, that prepare some food. And then he says to the he said to his wife, and put the kids to sleep. Tell them the food will be ready, the food will be ready, keep delaying it until they fall asleep. And the kids waiting for the food fell asleep. They fell asleep hungry. And then when it came time to eat, he told his wife, kill the candles so no, we, so no one can see what's going on will eat in the dark because the food in the plate wasn't enough for even three people. So him and his wife acted like they were eating, they just kept moving their hands around, the wife was on the other side of the curtain, he was acting like he was eating. And the only person eating that night was that guest. The wife, the husband, and the kids all fell asleep that night, they all went to sleep hungry that night. The next morning when he came to meet the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Allah was laughing at you last night. Allah was pleased with you last night. And then Allah revealed the ayah, that these people give preference over themselves, even though what they have is very little. You know, we ask ourselves, do we have little at home? Yes or no? Let's be honest. Do we have little at home or not? No, we don't. We have a lot at home. We all have, we have food that we aren't even aware of. I'm telling you right now. There is something in the corner of your pantry that you don't even know is there. You have some canned beans somewhere that you haven't had that you bought a long time back. Or some Kool-Aid somewhere. Why not share it with other people? Why not go out and give preference to others over the food that we have in our own homes? Aisha radiallahu anha narrates narration. She says that one day a poor lady came to her door asking her for food. And the lady was carrying two kids. So Father Aisha radiallahu anha counted, there were three people. So she gave them how many dates? Three dates. So the lady gave one date to each child. And while the lady was still talking to Aisha radiallahu anha, each of the kids quickly gobbled down their date. After they finished off their date, they started looking at their mother. Because in her hand, what did she still have? Ice cream. She still had her date in her hand. So they were looking at their mother. The mother then broke the date into two pieces and gave it to those kids. فَشَقَّتْ تَمْرَ الَّتِي كَانَتْ تُرِيدُ أَن تَأْكُلَهَا بَيْنَهُمَا So Aisha رضي الله عنها says, فَعَجَبَنِي شَأْنَهَا When I saw this, it amazed me that this lady decided to start. Aisha رضي الله عنها didn't have any kids of herself. So she was amazed of how much love this mother had for her kids and how she gave preference to her kids over herself. So she mentioned this to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ أَوْجَبَ لَهَا بِهَا الْجَنَّةِ that because of her generosity, because she gave preference to her kids over herself and remained hungry, Allah has made Jannah wajib upon that lady. I Meaning she's definitely going to Jannah. In one narration, Abu Talha al Ansari said to Umm Sulaim, You guys remember those names? Abu Talha Ansari, Umm Sulaim. I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture Anas bin Malik's parents. I told you I was going to come back to them. This is where I come back to them. One day, Abu Talha al Ansari came home and he said to his wife, Umm Sulaim, Today I heard the Prophet Sallallahu voice. It was very weak. This hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim, by the way, authentic narration. I heard the Prophet Sallallahu voice and it was very weak today. I noticed that he had hunger in his voice. I mean, he was very hungry. 
فهل عندك من شيء do you have anything at home قالت نعم she said I do she said I have some um, some flour I can make some bread and we can put something together and have a meal so he said I went to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and I found the Prophet of Allah in the masjid and there were a group of people with him so I came to the Prophet of Allah and said a messenger of no Abu Talha didn't come himself he sent a messenger he sent one of his servants he said go and call the Prophet of Allah so the messenger said I, I came to the mosque, the Prophet was sitting in the masjid, there were some companions sitting around the Prophet of Allah. He said, I got close to the Prophet, and right before I said anything to the Prophet, the Prophet said to me, Arsalaka Abu Talha? Did Abu Talha send you? Faqultu na'am. He said, yes, Abu Talha did send me. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Bitu'am, did Abu Talha send you for food? Is he inviting us for food? Qultu na'am. He said, yes, O Messenger of Allah, I did invite you. He said, I'm here to invite you for food. So the Prophet wasallam stood up in the masjid and made a public announcement, everyone, big party at Abu Talha's house. So this person, he said that I was terrified because Abu Talha specifically told me to invite only the Prophet and the Prophet wasallam just made a Facebook page. Everyone's coming. So he said, I ran home and told Abu Talha that the Prophet is coming and everyone's coming with him. So they said, if the Prophet of... So Abu Talha said, I ran to meet the Prophet to tell the Prophet we don't have enough food for everyone. So the Prophet saw him and he said to him, Don't worry, let's go home. So they arrived to the Prophet's home. The Prophet then told the Sahaba who were waiting outside, Come inside ten at a time. And as they came ten at a time, the Prophet he took the food and he fed them, and all of the Sahaba they ate. And the narration starts off, finishes off by saying, The group of people that came and ate that day were seventy or eighty men. They all came and ate. And the Sahaba learned this lesson of Ithar and they implemented it amongst themselves. One of the greatest examples of Ithar I find in the collection of hadith. Actually, I'll share that with you in a moment. Let me share one more narration. I'll share that story and then I'll close. The, 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 the other narration I want to share is from um, Hudayfa al-Adawi. He says that it was the Battle of Yarmouk. The Battle of Yarmouk, anyone know where it occurred? During the conquest of Rome. It's like the staple battle, the main battle. If you don't remember any battle during the con- conquest of Rome, except for Yarmouk, that's enough for you. It's like the Mabih al-Fasil, the main battle. Abu Bakr Siddiq one waited for that battle during his life, but passed away before the results came in. And Umar one during his Khilafah then re- received the results, and he used to cry every day making dua to Allah in Medina. As the Khalifa, Ya Allah, give the Muslims victory in Yarmouk. So, Hudayf al-Adawi says that, during the battle of Yarmouk, I was looking for my cousin so I can give him some water. I saw my cousin, and I asked him, can I give you some water? So he said to me, yes, give me some water. He was lying on the ground, injured. So he says, right when I was about to give him water, فَإِذَا رَجِرٌ يَقُولُ آه There was another person not too long, far away. He was saying, ah, he was crying in pain. So my, فَأَشَارَ إِبْنَ عَمِّي إِلَيْهِ أَنْ أَنْتَلِقَ بِهِ إِلَيْهِ So my cousin gestured to me saying, forget me, go to that person and give him water. So the Sahabi says, فَجِئْتُهُ فَإِذَا هُوَ هِشَامْ بِنْ عَاسِ He said, I came there and I found it was a Hisham bin Asa. So I said to him, can I give you some water? He said, yes, give me some water. Right when I was about to pour the water in his mouth, he said, I heard another man not too far away saying, ah, he was also in pain. So Hisham said to me, go there. He said, when I came there, فَجِئْتُهُ فَإِذَا هُوَ قَدْ مَاتْ When I came there, that third person had passed away. فَرَجَعْتُ إِلَى هِشَامْ فَإِذَا هُوَ قَدْ مَاتْ I came back to Hisham, he also passed away. فَرَجَعْتُ إِلَىٰ إِبْنِ عَمِّي I then came back to my cousin, فَإِذَا هُوَ قَدْ مَاتْ He also passed away. Each of them is at the brink of death, but they're still thinking of their brother. That person first, that person first, that person first. And I'll share with you the, um, that one story. The one ex- example I find that I think is unprecedented from the story of the companions when it comes to Ithar. I don't find any narration where I find Ithar more than this. This level of Ithar, even my brain can't process. Stories, some stories you read them and you think, okay, that makes sense. Maybe I could have done that. Maybe I could try to do that. But this is one incident of Ithar that I tell myself, if I was in those shoes, I don't think I'd ever be able to do it. You guys know which narration it is? Umar radiallahu an on his deathbed. He told his son Abdullah bin Umar to go to Aisha and ask if he can take her burial spot and be buried next to the Prophet Aisha had reserved that spot for her. 
It was her father, her husband, and her. And Abdullah bin Umar came and asked, My father is asking to be buried in your spot. I don't know how Aisha radiallahu anha gave the answer she gave. The level of ithar must have been unreal. In her mind, she must have been thinking, Okay, you take my place and be his companion in the world, because I'm going to be his companion for eternity in Jannah as a spouse. I don't know what she was thinking, how she thought it. But she says to Abdullah bin Umar, I give permission to Umar to be buried next to the Prophet. When, Umar, when, when he, Abdullah bin Umar came back, Umar radiallahu anhu, look at his justice. He said to Abdullah, maybe she felt forced to give me permission because I'm the leader. When I die, go and ask her again, after I'm dead. If she says yes, then bury me next to the Prophet. But if she says no, bury me with the Muslims. And they came a second time to Aisha after Umar radiallahu anhu passed away. And Aisha radiallahu anha this time also said, bury him next to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, Imam al-Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi in his Ihya, he writes that um, ithar is of three levels. He says the first is to give your brother what you would give to your servant. Meaning giving other people what you consider to be cordial, what you would give to other people, giving that in, 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 in charity. The second is, he says, you give him like you would give to yourself, more than just the servant. You give that person more than that. You give as you would give to yourself. And the third is, he said, you even prefer that person over yourself. And then Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi, finishes off by saying, Al-Ithaaru a'ala darajat al-Sakha. That Ithar is the highest level of generosity. So we take this lesson, this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, one of you cannot be a true, complete believer until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us hearts that are generous. Allah azza wa jalla allow us to care for those that are suffering, suffering and struggling across the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to give preference to our masajid, our madaris. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to give in this cause for His sake to the poor and needy, to those that are struggling, those that are oppressed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us hearts that pain with the pain of others, that care for the struggles of others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to take joy in seeing others beating us and being ahead of us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the best in this world and give us the best in the hereafter. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.